And now, in 2017, Grant, by the great, and thankfully not late, Ron Chernoff. <laughs> Mr. Chernoff has received many awards, including a Pulitzer Prize for Washington, A Life. His book on Alexander Hamilton was the inspiration for the Broadway musical Hamilton, for which he served as historical director. Now, I'm not sure if there's going to be a musical Grant, but an Oscar-winning actor has bought the rights to film Grant. That actor? Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, finally, as we speak tonight, I'm told that Senator John McCain, great Republican, is currently reading Grant. And we sure hope that Senator McCain is a slow reader and gets to read all 1,074 pages of it. And he gets to read it again and again, and he also gets to see the, mu the movie. And so, I'd like to present our current president, Mike Connors, and author, Ron Chernoff. Thank you very much. Okay, again, there's a, a little bit different format tonight. We're not going to have any questions at the end, so I'm up here, you know, trying to do our best to speak for everybody. But, Mr. Chernow, let's start with Grant. Well, West Point, how did he get into West Point, and how did he like West Point? First, I have to say, I feel like we should be reenacting the Lincoln-Douglas debate, you know, here <laughs> tonight, the way that this is set up. And I'm just so grateful to this group uh, for honoring me this evening that there's no praise sweeter than that that comes from uh, colleagues and peers and people who are interested in your subject. So thank you. Um, Grant did not want to go to West Point, to put it mildly. Uh, Grant's overbearing father, Jesse Root Grant, um, announced to Ulysses that he was going to West Point. In fact, Grant so dreaded the experience that uh, as he was taking the uh, train, from his home in southwest Ohio to West Point, uh, he kept hoping that the train would be in an accident, forcing him to return home. Uh, and he said that when he was at West Point, there was actually a debate going on in the US Congress as to whether or not to abolish the academy. And Grant was following this avidly, rooting that Congress would abolish the point. He said that the, that the two happiest days of his life, one was his last day's president, and the other was his last day at West Point, he made the statement that every year at West Point was equivalent to five Ohio years. <laughs> How well did he do at West Point? Well, you know, he actually did better than people think. Um, he graduated uh, uh, 21st out of 39. That sounds very, very uh, lackluster. But you have to realize that um, that class started with 82 members. There was always very, very heavy attrition in a West Point class. And so if you look at 21 uh, versus 82 instead of 39, he actually was kind of around almost the top quarter of the, uh, of the class. But um, he, was, uh, he was lackluster. He was um, uh, lackadaisical. Uh, it's interesting that the subjects that he excelled in were math, engineering, and geology. The two subjects that he did not do particularly well in were artillery and infantry tactics. Okay. Didn't seem to hurt his performance later on. Now, speaking of his performance, after West Point, Mexico. Yeah, he goes, goes to Mexico, and uh, Grant certainly, in retrospect, was very strongly opposed to the Mexican War. He said that um, never had a powerful nation, you know, um, um, imposed an unjust uh, war, such a wicked war, on a weaker nation. He always regretted that he had fought. But what I found going through his papers at the time was that he was rather enthusiastically fighting. So I think that some of that um, was um, retroactive uh, feeling about the, uh, the Mexican War. The Mexican War was enormously important for Grant uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, he was made a quartermaster. He also performed commissary uh, duties. And when he um, was made a quartermaster, he objected uh, because quartermasters did not fight. And he said that the reason that he was opposing the uh, appointment was that he did not want to uh, shirk service. He wanted to uh, see combat. He wanted to share the dangers of his men. And Grant, in battle after battle after battle, fought and fought courageously. He did not need to be in a single one of those battles. So that, to my mind, is real patriotism and real courage. And his 
experience as a quartermaster and doing commissary duty during the Mexican War was extremely important because um, Grant um, not only learned you know, tactics and strategy of war, uh, he learned the nuts and bolts of uh, an army. Um, and you know, during the Civil War, uh, Grant would be simultaneously overseeing four different armies across a 1,500-mile front in which his mastery of logistics, which started at the time of the Mexican War and his work as a quartermaster, was absolutely vital to what he did later on. So no experience was wasted in Grant's life, although I think at the time it seemed like it was. Mexican War is over. Where does Grant go? What, what happens to him? He stays in the Army. It's, 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 it's an unhappy period of his uh, life. He uh, marries uh, Julia Dent. Um, who was the daughter of a St. Louis uh, slaveholder named Colonel Frederick Dent, who owned about 30 slaves on a plantation uh, outside of uh, St. Louis. Um, Colonel Dent had warned his daughter that in marrying uh, Grant, Grant would not be able to um, provide for her in the Southern Belle manner in which she was uh, accustomed. And indeed, Grant is assigned to a pair of bleak, lonely outposts in Oregon and Northern California where he could not afford on his army pay to bring his uh, wife and children. Uh, he starts, uh, he's becomes very depressed, he's very lonely. Uh, he starts drinking and he finally in 1854 uh, leaves the army because of the drinking uh, problem. He shows up drunk uh, at a pay table for his men and really leaves the army in disgrace. And of course the Civil War, had, as you all know, had a very, very active and quite malicious rumor mill. And the story of Grant's drinking and the reason that he had left the army was something that would be trotted out repeatedly against him uh, during the, the Civil War. You know, he then uh, starts this very, very bleak period. He goes back to St. Louis. Uh, Julia had received as a wedding gift 60 acres uh, from her father. You know, Grant tried, tried manfully to make it as a farmer. He also would, every week, he would um, uh, chop down wood and he would uh, take it into St. Louis, and he would sell street, uh, wood, um, wood on street corners in uh, St. Louis. He looked very shabby. He looked very um, uh, defeated. And one day, he ran into uh, one of his officers from the Mexican War, who looked at Grant, who just looked so seedy and so depressed. Grant was selling firewood on the street corner, and he said, great God, Grant, what are you doing? And Grant said, I'm trying to settle the problem of poverty. It's kind of a wonderful line, because it shows that even at that bleak moment that Grant had this rather delicious uh, dry wit that did not abandon him. He can't make it as a, a farmer. Um, he then joins a real estate partnership with one of Julia's cousins called Boggs and Grant. In this real estate venture, Grant's job was supposed to be that he went around collecting rents from people. <clears throat> but Grant did not have any professional aggression of that sort when it came to business in his nature. And so apparently what would happen, because some of these people, customers, were old army friends, Grant would go to you know, collect the rent and would end up lighting a cigar and whiling away the afternoon telling army stories um, uh, with him. So that business failed. And that actually is a very, very sad period because uh, Julia and the children are out at this plantation, Whitehaven. Grant can't afford to bring them into town, St. Louis, where he's living. He can't afford a rooming house. So he's living in the back room uh, of the Boggs house that had an unheated room that had only three things. Um, it had a bed, a bowl, and a pitcher. Here's a man with a wife and four children, and he can't afford to be with them, and is living in this unheated little back room of uh, a house so that he could work in this failing real estate venture. Finally, what happens by 1860 is that Grant, in absolute desperation, goes to his father, and he swore he would never do this, goes to his father and begs for a job as a clerk in his father's leather goods store in Galena, Illinois, where Grant, and mind you, he's in his late 30s by now, he begs for a job as a clerk junior to his two younger brothers. You can imagine how this felt to him, a man who'd been at West Point, a man who'd fought in the Mexican War for uh, four years with great, great uh, distinction. Suddenly, is this rather, you know, bored, depressed, junior clerk in his father's uh, store. Then, of course, what happens, you all know the story, a year later comes Fort Sumter, and Grant turned out not only had all of that military experience from four years uh, in Mexico, he still had perfectly preserved in his mind all of this wisdom stored up from West Point and from many, many years in the uh, military. And one of the things that I say in the, 
the book is that the other figures that I've written about, and I think most great figures in history, when you read their lives, you feel that they could have thrived in any environment. You feel that they could have succeeded in whatever they did. And I say that Grant actually required a very, very kind of narrow and precise set of circumstances in order to flourish. And when Confederacy fired on Fort Sumter, that was Grant's moment. He suddenly meshed with his moment, and there was the exact right set of circumstances for all of these inner talents and all of this knowledge to come to the surface. Beginning of the war, Fort Donaldson, how is, how is Grant learning how to command? Well, Fort Donaldson, you know, was really the first great um, Union uh, victory and very, very um, important. Okay, Fort Donaldson is on the Cumberland River. It's up in the northwest corner of Tennessee. It's very important, flows down, you know, into the heart of the Confederacy. Also, whoever captured that fort would then control uh, the nearby capital, Tennessee, at, uh, at Nashville. And I think that it's very important for a number of uh, reasons. Number one, uh, Grant has to coordinate the attack uh, with the Navy. And I heard, I see my friend Harold Hulls in the back, he did a wonderful event with uh, Jim McPherson at the New York Historical Society last year. I remember, Harold, that Jim was saying that there was no one else at that point in the war, there was no official mechanism for coordinating Army and Navy. And Grant in Fort Henry, which immediately, that victory immediately preceded Fort Donaldson, and then Fort Donaldson, Grant with um, Flag Officer Andrew Hull Foote coordinates um, uh, the, not just the Union Army, but the, uh, uh, the Navy. And so what happens at Fort Donaldson is that the, um, the naval gunboats you know, are um, uh, firing on Fort Donaldson, which is still, if you visit it today, still kind of vast and powerful uh, earthwork, while Grant's army is pinning them down from the, uh, from, from the back. Okay, we then come to, let's say, the first crisis situation, Shiloh. Yeah. Well, Shiloh is, um, as you know, a two-day battle. It was, um, except for Antietam, I guess, the bloodiest uh, of the, uh, the battles. It's, it's two days. There are 24,000 casualties. Now, imagine the shock um, when this happened uh, in 1862, because 24,000 casualties in two days, that meant that there were more casualties in that two-day period than there had been in the Revolutionary War, the War of uh, uh, 1812, uh, and what war am I leaving out combined? So in other words, really kind of more than all the casualties in American military history up until that um, uh, point. The Union Army is surprised. You know, it's interesting that uh, Grant was an absolute stickler for um, accuracy. You could almost always count on what he said. He always told his children that honesty was the most important virtue. It was the one place where I found he shaded the truth. The Union Army was genuinely uh, surprised at 6 a.m. on the first day at Shiloh. The Confederate Army, you know, whooping, roaring with the rebel yells, bursts out of the forest, uh, swoops down on Union camps. Uh, Grant claimed that they were not surprised. They definitely uh, were surprised. And the first day is a Union failure. Um, Union Army is thrown back to, against the, uh, uh, the Tennessee River. But interestingly enough, Grant always said that the great thing at Shiloh was the resistance they made that first day, not the victory the, uh, the, the second day. But I don't think that any other general at that point in the Civil War would have reacted with the courage and fortitude that Grant uh, did. Okay, the first night of Shiloh, it's raining. You probably all know the story. It's raining, Grant is gonna sleep under branches of an oak tree, it starts raining, so he sees that there's a log house up the hill that's been commandeered as a field hospital, it goes up to the field hospital, and of course, as always happened, you know, after the first, <laughs> after a Civil War battlefield, the surgeons are there without any anesthetic, amputating limbs. Uh, Grant gets sick to his stomach, goes back out in the rain, uh, and he just decides he's gonna sleep under this um, oak tree. He's standing there, with rain dripping down his brim, you know, sucking on a cigar, and who appears out of the dark? Sherman. And Sherman says to him famously, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own David, haven't we? And Grant says, lick him tomorrow. Now pic picture the scene. There were several thousand corpses already strewn across the battlefield. It was raining heavily. Um, the soldiers uh, who had survived the first day were literally sleeping in puddles. 
There were wild pigs who were roaming the battlefield who were already feeding off the carcasses. Everyone who was there that night said it was the most nightmarish moment of their lives. And yet Grant decrees that 6 a.m. the next morning that they are going to mount a counterattack. I mean, this is such an audacious gamble. There had been so much bloodshed. I can't think of any Civil War general who would, ha would have had the audacity at that moment in the war to do what Grant did. And of course, they push the uh, Confederate army uh, back. And Sherman said that Grant's greatness as a general was that there was always, you know, the Civil War battles, as everyone in this room knows, they were often these seesaw battles. And Sherman said that Grant's great strength was in these seesaw battles. He was able to divine, that was Sher uh, Sherman's word, Grant was able to divine the precise moment that if Grant took the initiative, he would ride on to, uh, to victory. And he knew that exact moment uh, at Shiloh and pushed the Confederates back into northern Mississippi. All right, then I think we get into the true, or the true greatness of Grant, Vicksburg, Vicksburg campaign. I think it's his um, uh, masterpiece in, uh, in many ways. Let's, let me just mention one thing that I think is not mentioned often enough about uh, uh, Grant. He was a master of deception. You know, he, he runs the, he has to get to the high, dry land south of Vicksburg in order to attack this uh, fortress. He runs the gunboats and the transports past the big guns at uh, Vicksburg. Thanks to a local slave, he's told that there's an unguarded spot on the Mississippi 60 miles south of Vicksburg where he lands the Union forces. Okay, in terms of deception, because the deception is all important. Number one, he knew that P John Pemberton, who was the Confederate general overseeing Vicksburg, he knew that Pemberton would expect him to take the quickest route up to Vicksburg, which was along the water. Um, so Grant, in order to fool Pemberton, does indeed send troops um, up along the, uh, that route. That was, that was a feint. That was in order to throw Pemberton off, because the real uh, move was Grant is veering off to the northeast at a sharp diagonal towards the state capital um, at uh, Jackson. Very, very clever ruse. He also has uh, Sherman at a place called Haynes's Bluff um, feign an attack from the north. And uh, Pemberton was generally, genuinely fooled. Suddenly, Pemberton is getting all these reports that first that they're coming up from the south along the water, then they're coming up from the, uh, the north. And then kind of finally, um, Grant had sent uh, Colonel Benjamin Grierson, the famous horse soldiers raid, um, on a 600 mile rampage through eastern Mississippi. What that was all about, in part, was not only to rip up railroad tracks and take Confederate prisoners, but that was also to deceive John Pemberton. Um, Grant's strategy uh, is um, very effective. He ends up in a three week period winning five consecutive victories, lays a siege to uh, Vicksburg, uh, tries twice to mount an assault, doesn't work, but finally starves out the city. And you know the stories of people living in, in caves in, in Vicksburg. And then finally, uh, John Pemberton uh, realizes that um, they're being starved out and that he has no choice but to uh, surrender. And this, mind you, um, Grant, captures three entire Confederate armies during the war. Fort Donelson um, at Vicksburg, and then of course at Appomattox Courthouse. And I find it a strange thing in American history that U.S. Grant, who captured three entire Confederate armies, uh, that people could think that Robert E. Lee, who never captured a single Union army, was the greater general. Go figure. <laughs> All right. So we. We win the, he wins the Battle of Chattanooga. Grant comes east. Yeah. Robert E. Lee, U.S. Grant. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Grant finally comes east in uh, March 1864. Um, he's traveling. Uh, he made a very good decision, I think. Instead of being a desk-bound general-in-chief, he's going to... Um, he didn't want to lose that connection with the fighting in the field, so he decides that he's going to travel... Uh, with the Army of the Potomac under George uh, Gordon uh, Meade. Uh, Grant assembles an enormous, enormous uh, army of 115,000. 
uh, versus Lee had only a little bit more than half of that. Uh, Grant decides to cross um, the Rapidan River, uh, knowing that on the other side of it is a place called the Wilderness. And I don't know how many, probably a lot of you have been to the uh, the wilderness. Even today, if you're there, the visibility is like, you know, 20, uh, 20 yards. Um, it was a dense thicket of trees and shrubs, so-called second growth uh, forest. Um, I went when I was doing the research to the little knoll where Grand sat. He had to direct this entire battle of the wilderness, not based on sight, but sound. Because you could see, you couldn't even see as far as we can see in this room. So he's kind of ba judging based on, of course, couriers and messages coming into him, but also just the uh, sounds of uh, battle. It was, um, it was as horrifying a war, you know, battle as any in the Civil War for the simple reason that um, it was very dry um, and the, um, uh, the powder and fire uh, set, the, 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 set the trees on fire. There, there was brush and pine cone uh, which meant that people were being asphyxiated from the smoke. Um, it also meant that um, soldiers who were wounded were being roasted alive. And of course, rather than being roasted alive, soldiers started committing suicide, uh, feeling that suicide was preferable to, uh, to being roasted alive. It was a battle in which neither side, you know, from one point of view, won. There were certainly more Confederate casualties than uh, uh, Union casualties. But I think it was a big moral victory for, for Grant. And I thought of actually of opening the book with this scene. Because what happens at the end, the Army of the Potomac was so accustomed to not only losing to Lee, but then turning tail, crawling back to Washington, Northern Virginia, in defeat, in disgrace. And that night at the end of the wilderness battle, Grant tells his officers to be ready to, to move out. And so they start marching away, and they come to a crossroads where they expect to kind of wheel around to the left, which meant that they were marching back towards Washington and Northern Virginia. Instead, this entire gigantic army, they were wheeling around to the right. In other words, they realized that far from being defeated, they're going on to Richmond. And a tremendous cheer went up from the ranks, even though they had just suffered this incredibly you know, bloody uh, battle together, that they realized that they finally had someone in charge who was going to persist in attacking Robert E. Lee until the war was over. And that's what happened. And of course, it was longer and much bloodier than Grant or anyone thought that overland campaign was uh, going to be. But Grant kept steadily, steadily uh, pushing uh, Lee back and whittling down his army. And finally, at Appomattox prevailed. I'm getting to Appomattox. Yeah. What are your observations of Grant as a victor? Yeah, well, Grant is extraordinarily um, magnanimous in, uh, in victory. Uh, Robert E. Lee came to, the, uh, to that meeting um, at Appomattox Courthouse uh, wearing uh, his finest uniform and a, a dress sword because he said to his uh, officers, he actually thought he was going to be taken prisoner. Uh, and so he wanted to kind of you know, dress for this uh, moment. So he clearly, the fact that he thought he was going to be taken prisoner meant that he thought that uh, Grant was going to adopt a very punitive attitude uh, toward him. Um, Grant, when he was asked later what was on his, because Grant rides down the main street, uh, traveler is sort of munching you know, grass uh, uh, outside, so he knows that's the house uh, with Robert E. Lee. And Grant was asked later, um, what was on your mind at that moment? And Grant said the main thing on his mind was his own dirty boots. I mean, he was really not... You know, prepared. He had not expected this moment uh, to, to happen then, uh, and Grant had been uh, riding hard. It wasn't at all uh, a fashion or a political statement uh, by Grant. Um, it was uh, simply the happenstance of when this happened. Um, Grant wrote so movingly about this in his memoirs. I think it's the most uh, beautiful passage uh, in the book because he realized that Lee was a man of tremendous pride and dignity. He was trying to read Lee's face and couldn't realize that he must be struggling with very, very uh, deep uh, feelings. Uh, and then Grant made the following statement in his memoirs. Uh, he said that, said, I felt like anything uh, other than rejoicing over the downfall 
of so valiant an enemy and that had fought so bravely in a cause, although that cause was the worst for which um, an army could have uh, fought. And um, I think that, you know, I, I love that statement just because of the two sides of the statement, that he was able to separate the extraordinary courage and valor of the Confederate soldiers from the fact that this was all in a very, very um, misguided um, uh, cause. And, you know, what I love about Grant at Appomattox, it's not simply in terms of the generosity of the terms that he gave Lee, but Grant refused to allow his men to celebrate. There was no gloating um, over this. He didn't allow them to kind of, you know, fire off uh, victory salutes. Um, I love this story. Oh, and I think very important, this tells you everything you need to know about Ulysses S. Grant. <clears throat> Grant, believe it or not, never entered Richmond after Richmond fell. I can't think of another general that would have made that uh, decision. And in fact, Julia, was, Julia Grant was uh, eager for him to enter the fallen Confederate capital. And Grant said to her, Julia, don't you realize how bitterly these people are feeling their defeat? And would you want me to go into Richmond and just make them feel more miserable. He was always so afraid of making the South feel humiliated or embittered. Uh, and then even after the war, in the rotunda of the US Capitol, where there were all the famous historical paintings, there was a proposal to have a big historical painting of uh, Lee surrendering to Grant. And Grant vetoed that idea, saying that it could only embitter the South. All right, Grant becomes president. Now, we talked earlier that when we went to grammar school, high school, Grant was considered to be one of the worst presidents in the yeah. history of the United States. Yeah. What's your assessment? Yeah, you know, in the, uh, in the late 1940s, the, the first poll of presidential historians, Grant ranked next to the last. Uh, Warren, Warren G. Harding be beat him out for the distinction of being worst president in American history. That was how Grant was regarded. Um, in uh, the most recent poll, um, a few years ago, he'd moved up from, what was it, number 43 to uh, number 28. Uh, the very the poll just taken a couple of months ago, and I hope my book had a small part in this, he's now moved up to number 21 from number 43. So he's now kind of moving into the upper house. Upper half, I think, will go higher. Okay. What I try to argue in the book is that Grant has always been kind of, you know, tarred with the stereotype, this administration marred by nepotism and scandal. That happened, I spend a lot of time in the book uh, on that stuff, but I tried to make the argument that was not, to my mind, the main event. That was a very sad sideshow of his presidency. The main event was what Ulysses S. Grant did to protect the four million former slaves who were now full-fledged American citizens. Slavery had been abolished by the 13th Amendment. They'd been given equal protection under the law by the 14th. The 15th had given black males the right to, to vote. That 15th Amendment, which gave black males the right to vote, unleashed a wave of white terrorism in the South against blacks for daring to exercise their right to register and vote. The Ku Klux Klan reigned, conducted a reign of terror in every Southern uh, county. There was no Southern sheriff that would dare to arrest a member of the Klan. There was no Southern jury that would dare to convict a member of the Klan. There was no Southern juror who would dare to send a Klansman to, to jail. Grant took the new Justice Department. The Justice Department was created in 1870. Grant became president in 1869. Grant took the new Justice Department, named a crusading attorney general named Amos Ackerman, who was from Georgia, although originally from the North. And Amos Ackerman brings 3,000 indictments, gets 1,000 convictions against the Klan. He crushes the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan that we know today, which unfortunately is still with us, was the revival of the Klan in the 19-teens and 1920s and had parallels uh, to the original organization. But the original organization was really um, stamped out by Grant. This seems to me an enormous, enormous historical uh, achievement, and it's one that's been completely forgotten. I think that it's so much more important than a lot of the often you know, petty scandals that um, marked his administration and that unfortunately for a long time tarnished his reputation as a president. 
All right. Thank you very much, Ron Chernow. Get you out on time. Thank you, Thank you again. Charlie, we got we have a presentation.